So I would like to thank the organizing committee for the opportunity to be at this very important meeting and to visit Shanghai. It is my first trip here to Shanghai, although I have been China, to China before. It is amazing to see the growth and the prosperity uh, that has occurred even since my last visit in 1989. This morning I would like to talk with you about some of the lessons we are learning about the molecular diversity of human breast cancer. I believe some of the lessons we have learned will apply to other cancers as well. Here is a slide of eight different breast cancers, and we have known for the past many decades that our colleagues in pathology can describe the histology and tell us that there are groups, tell us very important information about the cancer here, whether or not it is invasive or in situ, whether it is well differentiated, attempting to form glands, or poorly differentiated with no attempt to form glands, whether the margins are infiltrating or filing or pushing, and what is the heterogeneity, as well as the nuclear grade of the tumor. All of this information has given us useful, predictive information regarding how the cancer may behave, but in large part, it is descriptive. The hope in the last 10 to 15 years has been that we can decipher the molecular genetic information that is behind this diversity and begin to understand the pathways that are involved in giving us this disease, breast cancer, and its diversity. The past for this cancer, as well as many, many cancers, has been a one-size-fits-all approach. Um, we have used essentially similar regimens to approach things like breast cancer and all breast cancers being treated very much alike, lung cancer, those being treated alike, colorectal cancer, etc., etc. But the reality is, while we use these approaches of surgery, radiation therapy, and systemic therapy, and we have had improvements in outcome for many cancers, it does not take into account that the disease, even within an organ, is a diverse disease, and that a one-size-fits-all approach may not give us optimum benefit. This is an example of an addition of a chemotherapeutic taxane uh, to anthracycline-based regimens. You can see about a 6% improvement in outcome and survival from this study of combination chemotherapy. This is a significant increase, but in truth it is a small increase. If you look at another study comparing different chemotherapies, you would see something very similar to this. In truth, in the last four or five decades, research has mixed and matched multiple kinds of chemotherapies and has given us these kinds of improvements between 2% or 4%. In occasional instances, when we combine these chemotherapies, we have caused more harm than good. In one regimen where eight different chemotherapies were used, the outcome showed that patients died more quickly from the therapy than they would have died had we left them to their own best supportive care. So the challenge has been this. Can we do better? With clinical translation of biologically relevant molecular information, theoretically should lead to more effective and less toxic therapies. In 1987, we were fortunate enough to be involved in research, which we reported, that said that in 25% of human breast cancer, there is an alteration in a gene called HER2, HER2, Human Epidermal Growth Factor Receptor Number 2. The alteration is results from amplification of the gene because of a mistake that is made during the copying of the genome when the cell divides. The mechanisms that copy the genome become stuck on a part of the chromosome, 17Q12, and make extra copies, too many copies. When this occurs, there is too much of the RNA 
too much of the protein and too much of this protein on the membrane of the cell. Now this gene encodes for a protein that is a growth factor <laughs> receptor. It receives signals from the outside, it sits on the surface of the membrane and transmits the signal to the nucleus of the cell telling it to divide. We know now that this is not an inherited alteration, but it is acquired sometime during the life of the individual. What we do not know is what precipitates this error, what makes this mistake happen. And if we understand that, we can think about how to potentially prevent it. However, when we find the alteration, we find that the tumors behave quite differently. Women whose cancer, breast cancer, contains amplification and overexpression of the protein have a very different outcome. Women whose HER2 gene is normal have a median survival of 6.8 years. Women whose HER2 gene is amplified to any degree have a median survival of three years. So the clinical outcome difference is very apparent when we apply the one-size-fits-all approach to this disease. Recent data from a number of uh, groups have shown very similar results in that they have begun to break breast cancer into at least four major groups. It is very likely that there will be seven major groups. But in this slide, from the Dutch group and another group, the Norwegians, show very similar results. In looking at breast cancer, this is the ER prognosis. In purple are the HER2 positive tumors, which have among the worst outcome in women with breast cancer. It is important to note that these data in particular on this part of the slide represent the natural history of breast cancer because these patients were treated with only surgery. They received no adjuvant therapy, either hormonal or chemo. They only received surgery and radiation because these samples were from the pre-adjuvant therapy era. So you are looking at the natural history of human breast cancer by these subtypes. To validate that HER2 was more than just a prognostic factor, we wanted to go back into the laboratory and ask why was it associated with a bad outcome. The two possible explanations were that it is associated with an outcome because it is a useful flag or marker of aggressive breast cancer, but it plays no role in the disease. The alternative explanation is that it's associated with a bad outcome because it pay, plays a direct role in causing the bad outcome. When we started this research, we were looking for molecules like that so we could consider the possibility of targeting them. So to validate the target, we did the following thing in the laboratory. We took human breast cancer cells that do not contain this alteration and we cloned the gene from a tumor and introduced multiple copies into these cells to convert single copy normal expressors into multiple copy high expressors. This simply shows that it can be accomplished. This is what you see in normal tissue or in cells that do not have the alteration. There is very faint staining on the membrane of these breast cancer cells. There are approximately 25 to 50,000 receptors per cell in the non-amplified cases. However, when we introduce